so um, please do sign in to the uh, to the shared document as usual. Um, and also, if you could uh, join the Slido, the link to the shared document um, just under the notes from the presentation section, but you can also go join at slido.com with the code that's there on the screen. Um, and if you could just answer this while we're waiting, just to sort of get a handle on, on the audience we've got today. I'll, uh, I'm really hoping that I'm going to get more no's and I'm not sure than, than yeses uh, today, uh, because this session's really aimed at a sort of um, like people who haven't written tests before or have written one once and aren't quite sure on the best way to to, to, to write them more and, and and on what the point of it really is if you see what I mean um so just give people a little bit longer to sign in and to to um answer the poll oh dear the yeses are outnumbering the noes I'm, I'm hoping I'm not going to disappoint everyone with this session this session can't see anyone's faces now because I'm sharing with an optimized screen share for video clip, which um, I'm going to try and show the video panel anyway. Alison, I'm sorry, I just can't seem to paste the proper link. I just keep copying and pasting, but, and it, it keeps keeps coming up as. Oh, James's. the slider link. Oh, sorry. Not the slider link, uh, the notes, the collaborative notes. Oh, the notes I, keep... I, thought, I thought I pasted it. Did I not? Oh, yeah, just do it again. I'll do it oh, again. Oh, yeah. sorry, sorry. I've pasted the bit no, link, but it goes to, so please ignore my um, my uh, link in the chat. Thank no, you. I'll share that again. <laughs> cool. Uh, how many people have we got in the session? I'll just wait for a few more responses to the poll. Uh, I really hope I'm not going to disappoint people today because uh, <laughs> got a lot of people who've already written automated tests. This is really a sort of low level, like, Sorry, not low level, but a kind of a really basic introduction to testing and to, to, to CI and um, in the hope that can persuade people who don't like writing automated tests that they, they should be writing them, I guess. Um, they're still filling in, so I'll hold off on starting properly. Ah, thanks for the chat. Oh, uh, I can't join the slider. Uh, have you got the right number, uh, Ginestra? Yes, it should work. Uh, thank you. Let me just double check that that is live. It's showing that it's live right now. Um, just to say, uh, today I'm going to be um, I'm going to be sharing a pre-recorded videos of. of sort of coding because there's not time in a half hour session to do live coding um, or to make mistakes in live coding rather, which always happens. Um, but I hope people can read it on screen. I hope it's clear enough, but if it's not, then um, all of the code and there's a little sort of tutorial on the homepage of this re code repository. Um, so uh, if you're struggling to see the videos then hopefully you'll be able to see the steps um, on GitHub. Uh, so. Um, please do feel free to sort of just shout out questions as you go as I go along if anything is unclear um, or to write them in the shared document in the um, questions section there and I'll try and sort of just check back on that as I go along um, so that we don't sort of go to the end and then realize that someone was confused about something in the very first section uh, and also please feel free to sort of ping me on slack afterwards if you've got any questions um, so um just a quick introduction to me. Uh, I'm a research software engineer at Durham University, um, I'm one of last year's SSI fellows. Um, my background is as a software engineer in industry. Uh, so pretty much since I started work back in 2004, um, I've been writing automated tests for the code I've written. I'm not saying that everything I've worked on has been fully tested uh, or perfectly tested, um, but I think there's very, very little things I've worked on that haven't had any tests at all. Uh, thank you for the people who've been sharing the Slido link. Uh, sorry that the code's not working. I don't know why that is. Uh, but anyway, so we've got a lot of people here who have written tests before. Uh, and I guess hopefully you've come along to sort of find out uh, why they're so useful. And uh, I hope I can explain that today. Um, as I say, it's going, going right in at the beginning of, of having a bit of code and you have no idea where to start testing it. Um, so hopefully it'll give you, it'll help you save you time as you write code, and it'll hopefully give you greater confidence in the results. Um, I'm going to start with a single Python script and refactor it 
into functions to allow us to test it, write the tests, and if we've got time, we'll get them running in CI as well. So let's uh, switch to my videos. Something right there. Something like this. So, sorry, I'm actually just going to minimize that because the controls are better on the smaller screen. I hope that's clear for everyone. So, uh, let's just going to start this video. Not that one. Right. So, um, Here's the script that we're going to be looking at today. Uh, it's not very sophisticated, um, but this is the, the idea is that this is uh, something that you know you might have a long script sitting on your computer somewhere, and you don't quite know where to start in terms of adding a test. Um, so all it does is it generates some data, and it lays it out in a square grid, and then it does something really really complicated, i.e., sleeps. Uh, and then it sort of prints out the grid at the end. <coughs> so obviously, sort of in um, in a real real world sort of scenario, you would actually be doing something quite complicated here that could take a little bit of time, um, and that could be quite frustrating if you want to try it out with different parameters and things like that. So, sorry, just rearranging all my windows. So here's what happens. Uh, when you run the code, so we just run it with Python main apply. Those of you who are in James's session, you'll see a lot of things here that um, he told you, you shouldn't have been doing. Uh, and hopefully, uh, hopefully we'll we'll start to improve on that today. Uh, so you can see it just runs. It um, prints out this square grid of numbers, and that's all it does for now. But it does take a little bit of time to run. Um, so now let's imagine that we need to allow the user to determine the size of the data. Uh, so to do that, we're going to uh, use uh, sys.rv. Again, as James said, don't use that. Um, <laughs> but um, just for the purposes of this demo, we're just going to use it. We're going to um, leave the uh, input validation as a sort of exercise to the reader. And um, we're just going to take the, the input from the command line and turn that into an integer. Um, and then, um, don't forget to import it. Um, so then we need to change our um, data generation so that it uses that parameter uh, that was passed in and generates the um, data of the right length. And we also need to update our grid. So we need to work out what the grid size should be. Uh, for now, we're just going to, we want it to be a square grid. So as a starting point, we're just going to use the square root of the data size and just turn it into an int. I know that's not perfect, but it's just, just, just for demo purposes, this is what we're going to do right now. And then we also need to um, just change the parameters in our loop. And here's how we run it now. So we pass it a parameter on the command line and we wait for it to run and we wait and it gives us our grid and it also works with the number nine, but we have to wait and we have to wait and eventually we get our answers. But what happens if we try it with a number that's not square? So wait, we try it, we wait, we wait and Ah, something's wrong there. We're missing some numbers in our grid. So we've got eight things in our list and we've only got a grid of four numbers. So clearly just rounding down the grid size is not working for us. We're not getting all of our great data into the grid. And because of our sort of complex calculation code, trying out all of these different options takes quite a long time. So it'd be really good if we could just try out the part of the code that calculates the grid size with different options. And this is where automated testing can help us. Now, the first thing that we need to do um, when we write our test, we'll need to um, import our code uh, into that test file. Uh, because currently all of our code's running uh, in the main body of the script, um, the import will take a long time uh, because it'll have to run all of that code. 
Uh, so the first thing we need to do is to put all of that current code into a separate function. So to do that, we just write our function definition, it doesn't have any parameters, and we just indent all of the rest of the code. And then we add the sort of magic idiom at the bottom of the file, which hopefully you're familiar with, but it's a standard way of sort of doing this in Python. Um, so this means that sort of we call the we'll call the, the bit in the if loop will get called if the function, if the script is being called as the sort of as the main argument, the sorry, whenever the files run from the command line. Um, and we just call our function there. And it runs as before. Sorry, probably never buttons is uh, making my taskbar move. So that, that still works as we, as we expect. Um, but the other thing we need to do is to put the, the code that we want to test into a new function. So we'll define a new function called get grid size, and it'll take a parameter data size. And then we can just copy our code from further down our script, not that one, uh, that one down there. Um, and then in our, in our main function, we can just um, call get grid size uh, with the data size that's passed in. And again, we'll just check that that works before. Um, and so it should be, the video passes, gets to the end. Uh, I, I clearly trimmed this video uh, too far, but it does actually run uh, as it should do. So, um, so we've now got our script in a state that we can actually, um, we, we'll be able to start writing some tests for it. Uh, the next thing we're going to do is to install the PyTest package. Uh, Python does come in with a built-in testing framework called unit test, uh, but PyTest can be easier to use. I've just realized I haven't been checking the document for questions. Ah. I'll have a look at that question uh, at the end of the session. I think it says, uh, Thank you. Um, sorry, so we need to install PyTest uh, because I, I think PyTest is just a bit easier to use than, than unit test. Um, I'm going to sort of use pipm to install it, and it's the first uh, dependency that I've got. So uh, it will have to set up the shell at this point. So, uh, but clearly you can sort of install this using Conda or Poetry or pip, uh, whatever you'd normally use for your dependency management. Um, I, just also to note, I'm installing. PyTest as a dev dependency, uh, which you can do in, in pip and various other dependency managers, uh, because it's not needed by people who need to run the code, just by people who are developing the code. So uh, you can see that we sort of install that with pip -env, and then we open a pip -env shell, um, and we can run the code as before. So now let's write our first test. So we've created a new file, main underscore test.py. Um, and then we import our get grid size function into that file. And we write a function starting with test underscore. Now this is important. So PyTest will file, find any file uh, named test star or star test.py, uh, and it'll run any functions with name starting with test underscore. So we've imported our function, and now we need to write uh, an assert statement. So, um, so I'll just stop there a minute. So uh, if you're not familiar with assert, basically what it does is it will raise an error uh, if what follows the assert uh, doesn't evaluate to true. So anything that was false, so if our number didn't match here, um, that would raise an error or anything non-zero or anything not non would, would raise that um, assertion error and fail the test. So here we're saying that if we call grid, get grid size with 16, we expect the answer four. And if we call it with uh, nine, we expect the answer three. And now uh, we should be able to run that test. We just write PyTest, and that should run it. And you can see how little time that took compared to running that whole main file. That was super quick. Um, and it tells us that the test passed, which is great. And that's a lot faster than waiting for our function to run several times uh, with, with those parameters. So we need to add some more test cases uh, for, for non-square numbers. Uh, you might have noticed that I had to copy and paste some code before um, uh, to, to try out this function with two different values. Um, but PyTest offers a better way of doing this, um, which is another way to save you time. Um, so we're going to import PyTest, 
and then we're going to define an array that has our test values in as tuples. So how are we going to use this list? Sorry, I, I use a non-Python terminology sometimes because I've used different many languages in the past. So it's a list of tuples. Um, and the first item in the tuple is, um, is a number we're going to call get grid size with. And the second item is the answer that we expect. And so we then use this sort of magic decorator function, pytest.mark.parameterize, and we tell it, um, we give it parameter data size expected, and we give it our list. And what this does is it means that this, our test function will be called for every item in the list, and it will be given the parameters data size and expected, um, which would be the two items in our tuple. And then we just need to modify this function um, so that it uses the parameters that are passed in. So we expect in every case that get grid size with data size will be the value that's passing in expected. And again, that runs as we expected. So now we're going to add some extra test cases here. So we're going to add some non-square numbers. And in this case, I'm going to add a number that's one bigger than a square and one smaller than a square, because the sort of edge cases tend to be the ones that, that cause us problems. Um, so now if we run PyTest, you can see that we've got two issues here. Um, pause a minute. Um, it's run two, two, two test cases passed, which are the first ones, and then two failed because we wanted a grid size that was big enough to hold all of our data, all of our 10 data items, um, and the grid size it gave was the wrong size, and that, that's not what we wanted. Uh, so we wanted a grid size of four, if we gave it 10, and we and the same for 15. Um, so those have failed, so let's see if we can fix our function to, to make our tests pass. Um, so, what all we need to do in this case, uh, you probably realize, is just use math.seal uh, to get the answers that we're wanting. Um, and that will give us the biggest, the number that will round the number up rather than down. Um, and that means that we will have a grid that is big enough to fit all of our data in it. And you probably want to add some further test cases. So like you might want to see what happens if you zero or if you use negative numbers or very large numbers. Um, but the good news is that if you do that, it'll take barely any extra time to run on the sort of 0 0.01 seconds um, that, that it's taking currently. It's a lot quicker than waiting for your code to run if you're running the whole script. It's a lot quicker than typing the different parameters in on the command line. And it means that you're not going to miss a test case if you try and run this again. Now, it might feel like we haven't saved very much time so far because this has taken a little bit of time to set up. And you could probably see how to fix the function before we started writing the tests. But we've now got a test that's going to flag up if anything changes in future that might break that functionality. And we've also, now we've added one test, it'll take a lot less time to add further tests for other tricky parts of the code later on. Um, so one way that to, to ensure we don't forget to run our tests after making uh, further changes is to set up continuous integration. Now that might sound a little bit scary, but it's actually quite easy to set up using GitHub Actions. Uh, so I'm gonna show you how to do that now. So you go to the Actions tab in GitHub for your repository, and it will suggest, make some suggestions of the sorts of, um, let me just go back a bit, of the sorts of um, actions that, that might be helpful. And it will sort of guide you through this process a little bit. So here I've chosen the um, Python application uh, one, and then, I'm just going to change the name of the workflow because um, it's not really an app. Um, I'm going to change the Python version just to match the one that's on my system. Ideally, you could change this to run on multiple Python versions, but it just matches my pip and file at the moment. Um, so then this next, so, so each section in this is a section that will run on a clean environment uh, when we run our CI. So the first step is to check out the code. The next step is to check out set up Python. Um, so we're using Python 3.9, as I said. Um, and now we install our dependencies. So this template um, installs PyTest for us, but because we've got our pipenv, uh, our pip file, we're gonna use pipenv to do that installation. So we're just gonna change that. So we install pipenv and then um, 
we instead of installing from a requirements file, we just use pipenv install uh, with the dev flag because we want our test pytest to run. We'll leave that lint step in, and then at the bottom we just change the pytest so that it runs via pipenv. Um, we save that file, and then if we go to the actions tab uh, in back to the actions tab in GitHub, um, it um, sorry, it shows that our it's running the CI already just from that single commit. Um, I had to refresh this a couple of times when I was running it because it doesn't always start straight away. Uh, but it should, uh, eventually, it'll show you what it's running. It shows you each step in the process. And it installs the dependencies. Uh, eventually. And just create the virtual environment. And now it's installing things from pip file. Sorry, it's taking its time. This is almost slow as waiting for our code to run in the first place. Um, we test it with PyTest, and you can see that that test passed. And then we get a green tick, which is all we ever, every, all we ever wanted, really. Um, I know this is a very, very whistle-stop tour to sort of CI with GitHub Actions. Um, there are links um, to, to more documentation on that on the readme uh, and the repository that's linked to. Um, so this is a very sort of quick introduction to adding tests to your project and hopefully convince you that it can actually really save you time. And although, you know, it feels like we've taken a bit of time to set all of this up, I do think it's something that our sort of future selves will, will thank us for later on um, because we've got some tests and we've also got that framework set up to make it easier to add further tests in the future. So I've just got uh, one little one more poll for you if you get to the Slido. Um, so I'd just love some suggestions of what else we could add tests for in our little code example. And I'll just uh, link to the code uh, file on GitHub so you can just look at that as well as Slido. So what else in that file could we add a test for? None number inputs, yep, thank you. Yeah, we clearly need to, to do that um, when, we're, when we're checking command line parameters. So you might want a separate function to do that and to just check that it sort of throws an appropriate error before trying to do anything with that input if it's not valid. Any other suggestions? And has anyone noticed the uh, semi-deliberate mistake? with the code as it stands now. Previously computed results. Would anyone like to, whoever put that, like to expand on it, either in the chat or just feel free to unmute yourself. Okay, so if you know what the answer should be, um, to sort of add a test to, to check that, that it gives you the right answer. Is that, is that what you're meaning? Yes. Checking the dimensions of the input data, yeah. Is the reshaping done consistently? Yeah, that's the big question. The sign of the numerical arguments, yeah. Those are all good things. So the one thing that I was gonna... Um, code style? Yeah, um, so I often use a black to sort of do the automatic sort of code style checking and fixing. Um, so that's not part of the test suite itself, but, um, uh, but yes. Uh, so I'm just gonna uh, bring this code back over to my window. Uh, sorry. Lost all my windows now. Sorry, I'm just gonna move this code over. So, Sorry, I'm struggling to rearrange my windows. I didn't put this in the right screen earlier today and it doesn't want to move. Um, so let's just see if I can find a video. Sorry, this window seems to have died somehow. 
Well, it's not letting me close it. There we go. Um, so this is just back to the code that we were looking at before. Um, now, currently, we've got a grid size that is bigger than the, that can hold more. Once it's square, it can hold more than the data. Um, so this is one thing that I had to change from the code that I showed you earlier, um, was to make sure that we have, um, that there is actually a value in the ith position in our data. So when we get to the end of that grid, um, it will populate it with a default value. So in this case, I've chosen to use minus one. So I think if I were, if this were real, real code, I would extract this function, this, um, this part of the code that lays the, um, lays the numbers out into the grid, into a separate function that someone suggested, and then we could double check that it can actually cope with all of the values that, that we're passing it. So that's it for my sort of whistle stop tour of how to write tests. Um, I'll just have a quick look and see if we've got any questions in the doc. Stop sharing now. So, Jupyter Notebooks. Ooh, things with code cells. I have to admit, I'm not a big user of Jupyter Notebooks, so I don't know the best um, best way of testing those. Um, I don't know if anyone else else here is able to to help out with that. James, please feel free to, to so jump in. Consider there, which uh, is actually abstracting a lot of your functionality out into methods, as you say. So yeah. you can import the methods or export the Jupyter notebooks as Python code, or you can move it off into a separate Python file uh, so that you can unit test the, the, the functions. Yes. Yeah. Uh, example code snippets in doc strings. Oh, so you want to test the, the example code snippets. <laughs> Again, I would probably try and um, sort of have them as actual real code somewhere and um, and then um, I don't know, possibly even automate the process that actually puts the snippets into the doc strings um, when you commit or something like that. Um, oh, can someone? Ah, cool. Thank you. That's brilliant. Someone's answered that question for me. And um, Saranjeet, have you got a question? Yes, so or... I was saying that uh, that is this alternative that I found to Jupyter Notebooks called as Next Journal. Uh, and these are really lightweight and you don't have to install anything on your system for using those. Thank you. That's really helpful. I'm going to save this text chat and I'll try and paste it into the document at the end. Um, so thank you for everyone who's posted helpful things in there. Uh, I guess time's pretty much up, but um, I hope this has been useful. And um, please do feel free to sort of grab me on Slack or email me if you've got any further questions. Thank you.